Now, thanks to new fossil discoveries and technologies, we're getting to learn more and more about the biology of dinosaurs. Some people don't need to know more than the fact that a few of them were colossal, terrifying, and vicious. But for those of us that do, the use of comparative biology, pigment analysis, and powerful new x-rays have allowed us to gain insight into specific features, such as their colors, eating behaviors, and the shapes of their tongues. Yes, that's right, the shapes of their tongues, which, for a long period of time, was something of a mystery. This is because soft, fleshy dinosaur parts are hardly ever retained in fossil form. But thanks to the discovery of some surviving hyoid bones, which are situated at the root of the tongue in front of the neck, we now have some insight. Most animals have this hyoid bone that anchors the tongue. The shape and complexity of the bone determine how free-moving the tongue can be. Scientists have discovered that nearly all dinosaurs had simple tongues that laid flat and were extremely similar to the tongues found inside the mouth of a crocodile today. Yeah, this crocodile. Go ahead and take a closer look. Nah, just kidding. Come on back. Let's take a look at some specific dinosaurs and start with a Brachiosaurus. Let me stick my neck out on the line by guessing that most of you will be familiar with this dinosaur because of its neck. You know, the one which was typically 30 feet in length? Despite its neck being its most distinctive feature, its name actually translates to arm lizard in Greek. It's common knowledge that the Brachiosaurus is one of the largest dinosaurs to ever have lived. On average, it reached 76 feet in length and 40 feet in height, as roughly the length of two school buses and as high as a four-story building none of which were around in the era of the big guy here. Fragmentary leg bones and vertebra of even larger dinosaur species are known, but these skeletal remains are too incomplete to determine their exact size. So this guy may have been the largest dinosaur ever. A renowned herbivore, thank goodness. The Brachiosaurus is thought to have eaten up to 880 pounds of dry plant matter every day. Most of this was made up of coniferous trees, ginkgos, and cycads. This target might have been hard to hit for this dinosaur, as researchers have learned that its teeth were spoon-shaped and not ideal for chewing food. This means that the creature would have swallowed vegetation whole, as its teeth were suited to stripping it but not breaking up large chunks of plants. This, along with the dinosaur's body shape, suggests that the Brachiosaurus would have liked to feed as quickly as possible. Dinos like these didn't always make use of their ability to strip towering trees when dining. The Brachiosaurus traveled in herds, moving to the next location once they had exhausted all of the local vegetation. And I mean all of the local vegetation, not just that which hung high on trees. It's likely that the creatures supplemented their diets with vegetation at lower levels, especially after they'd done a number on all the nearby trees. This method of feasting was the most energetically appealing for this giant. By munching on lower vegetation, researchers believe that the dinosaurs saved up to 80% in energy compared to when foraging for high-up food sources. They have also discovered that the nostrils of a Brachiosaurus were on the front of its face and not the top. This is because we now know they roamed the fertile floodplains in their respective herds. For decades, it was believed that these creatures lived in deep, watery swamps. Let's look at another common misconception about a popular dinosaur. Please put your hands together for the Tyrannosaurus rex, which is arguably the most famous of all dinosaurs. Discoveries from the past 100 years have revealed that theropods had heavily feathered skin. Theropods are the family of dinosaurs to which the T. rex belongs, so naturally, people began to think that the creature would have been covered in feathers as well. However, a study from 2017 took skin impressions from the iconic dinosaur and found no evidence of the structures required to support feathers. If a T. rex did have feathers, they would have been limited to its back. Researchers accept that other large dinosaurs of the same family as the T. rex have been discovered with their remains covered in feathers. An example of this would be the Uteranus dinosaur. 
But as of now, the accepted theory is that feathers weren't a common feature of T-Rexes. This makes it easier to believe that feathers were exclusive to smaller tyrannosaurids and were there as a means of keeping the creature warm. For a long period of time, researchers thought feathers were an exclusive feature of the theropod family. But this theory has been debunked. Just like the kid at camp who was kicked out of the top bunk. You know, debunked. Anyway. Fossil evidence discovered in Siberia now suggests that multiple different family groups of dinosaurs had feathers. The Siberian fossils in question belong to another species of dinosaur, Calendodromius zabicolicus. Oh, you think I mispronounced that? Okay, prove it. Now, this dinosaur, I'll call her Kalinda, had a pelvis structure superficially similar to that of a bird and was roughly 4.5 feet long, about as tall as a fridge. Since the purpose of feathers on dinosaurs was for warmth, it's quite possible that dinosaurs from cold-weather climates had more feathers than their counterparts in warm-weather climates. In general, bigger animals struggle less with keeping themselves cool, so it's likely that any of the large dinosaurs who lived in these warm climates had no feathers at all. Smaller dinosaurs who lived in cold climates, on the contrary, had plenty of feathers. We now even understand what some of the designs and patterns of these feathers on dinosaurs looked like, thanks to the discovery of an ornithomimus, complete with feather and skin impressions. The name of this dinosaur is derived from Greek and actually translates to bird mimic. They were typically 11 and a half feet in length, nearly as tall as a giraffe, and despite being omnivorous, had no teeth. Its other distinctive features include three fingers which were all unusually the same size and length. And despite their thin bone skulls, they also had large brain cavities. Their legs were extremely long, in particular their foot bones. Combine this with their toothless beaks and long necks, and yep, it must have looked a lot like an ostrich. Although they're not as big as the brachiosaurus or dinosaurs in general, they are bigger than any other bird in the world. And it wasn't just the body limbs of an ornithomimus that made it resemble an ostrich. They also had very similar feather patterns. Their heads, necks, and lower legs were mostly bare of feathers, but the rest of their bodies were well coated in downy plumage. This is what you call a bird's layer of feathers as a whole. It's possible, like an ostrich, that the dinosaur would have used this unusual feather pattern to regulate its body temperature. Despite some dinosaurs possessing feathers like birds, on top of also being their distant relatives, dinosaurs didn't have the type of feathers required to fly for most of their existence. Feathers found in fossil impressions or preserved in amber have allowed researchers to gain insight into why these creatures weren't very aerodynamic. The structure of these feathers appears to be very simple, with a poorly defined and flexible central shaft. These feathers would have better served any dinosaur as a fashion statement, as they would have helped attract the attention of other dinosaurs. These feathers also would have had the ability to regulate body temperature. Surprised to hear that dinosaurs had ostrich-like feathers? <laughs> Wait till I tell you that their prehistoric distant reptile cousins had something that looked like fur. Allow me to introduce you to the pterosaur. Its name is derived from Greek and translates to wing lizard. Just like dinosaurs, they were initially thought to have scaly or leathery skin all over their bodies. But over the course of the 20th century, fossil examinations revealed that many parts of a pterosaur's body were furry. The wingspan of a pterosaur could reach the length of over 23 feet, about as long as a London bus. Its toothless jaw was very long and resembled that of a pelican. How could something that looks like a pelican be so terrifying? These creatures were coated in pycnofibers. Those were simple structures, feather-like in composition, but strand-like and fuzzy like fur. Further research suggests that some parts of the pterosaur's body had more complex kinds of feathers with branching strands. If this is accurate, it would be the first time feathers were found on an animal that was neither a dinosaur nor a bird. You wake up with your head feeling heavy. Mmm, one, where's your comfy bed? And two, 
Why were you just sleeping on the wet and dirty ground in the middle of nowhere? Wait, what's all this stuff around you? Are you in the jungle? There's a backpack nearby with essentials like water, cookies, candy bars, and a jacket. It's yours for sure, but still, hello, how on earth did you get here? Wait, jacket? It's insanely hot. You definitely won't be needing that. Seriously, what is this place? Giant leafy plants? Thick rainforest trees? Huh? Kinda looks like Jurassic. You jump in fear, look around, and run under one of those shady plants. Okay, not a great choice and definitely not the best time to recall that you're terrible at hide-and-seek. There's a huge, weird-looking animal coming out of the bushes, staring at you. Dinosaur! You scream, you shiver, you cover your eyes. Not exactly how you were expecting your morning to go. Wait a minute. Dinosaurs don't bark. You open your eyes. That thing definitely charged at you. But now it's just jumping around, wagging its long tail, barking, and sticking its tongue out. And it looks so familiar. It's a dog? You almost cry out in relief. That thing's weird. Dogosaurus? What else could it be? Big, gray, and hairy, but insanely familiar to a T-Rex. Its front legs are actually short little arms, and its long muzzle with sharp teeth is all over you. Well, Dogosaurus is covering you with dino slobber. Another hairy thing comes out of the bushes. White and fluffy, short front legs, long dark gray tail, ridiculously big ears. It's a dino rabbit! The two animals start chasing each other and goofing around. Um, is this for real? Dogosaurus gets bored and comes running up to you, starts rubbing his head on your arm. You pet it, while also wondering what to do next. What happens if this thing gets annoyed or hungry? I'm gonna call it Max. You grab a random stick and throw it as far as possible. Well, at least that's over. The dino dog's gone and questions start overloading your brain. What's that thing doing in the jungle? What else lives here? Are they all gonna be that friendly? It doesn't take long to find out. A horrifying sound fills your ears. You turn slowly this time. Another surprise! Just a few feet away, another huge beast is staring at you. Its eyes are the scariest part, wide open and pointed directly at you. You hold your breath. It could all be over in an instant. But after a moment, you let out a sigh of relief. It's only a zebra. Well, zebrasaurus. Bizarre. Black and white stripes over a muscular body, and wow, that head is long. Its tail looks like it means business, and its back is covered with bony plates. Zebrasaurus takes a step forward. Zebras. They just eat grass and stuff, right? Hope this thing does too. Let's see, three options. Run, lie still, or pet the giant zebrasaurus. Wham! A way more hairy beast jumps out of the bushes and the race is on. Was that a chuckle? A laugh? Wait, was that a hyena? Hyenasaurus? Hyenas have one of the strongest jaws and necks around. That plus dinosaur? Pretty serious combination. One option, run. That zebra seems to know what's up. You start running, fighting off huge leafy plants and tripping over the roots of tall jungle trees. You jump, duck, dodge, and finally get out of the jungle. A beach. Perfect! Now you've got time to think about what you just saw. What's the plan now? Ocean, palm, sun, and finally, some fresh sea air. You take a deep breath and close your eyes. Quiet as a feather, giant paws softly crushing the grass, the whoosh of an elegant tail. Huge, grayish, and strong, with insanely long claws hidden in her big soft paws. And the head? Gross. You do a double take. Still gross. It looks like a bare skull with sharp teeth and warm yellow eyes. This animal's not interested in you at all. It crouches down, looks ready to pounce. Then the catasaurus lazily purrs and starts licking its fur. Well, at least it didn't think you looked like a mouse, a stick, a ball, a cardboard box. Cats like the weirdest things. Hmm, no time! The beach is suddenly full of gigantic red crabs. There's hundreds of them lying around, resting their long, sharp claws. Since when do crabs have ten eyes and four huge claws? Crabosoraptors do. You cover your mouth, but the scream comes out anyways. You run back into the jungle. Not the best idea.
This time, you run and never look back. Your only goal is not to hear those rasping, clicking Crabosoraptor claws anymore. Something's different, though. The jungle's changed. The jungle looks like it's morphing. No more vines, huge weird leaves. The air's cooler. The paths are a bit wider. Apparently, you're in a forest now. You come across a large open field with a big dreamy lake in the middle. Perfect selfie location, apart from all those dino things, and trees that can shapeshift, apparently. A piercing scream flies across the lake. Pretty easy to recognize this graceful animal, even if the color's a bit off. It's a gray swanodactyl, S-shaped neck and everything. But this swan's had a few upgrades installed. Razor-sharp beak, big strong claws, and eyes that look like they can spot a tasty meal from miles away. Well, you're not a fish, so you'll probably be alright. Apart from that, the lake is gorgeous. Water lilies everywhere, the size of tables. Humongous lilies, humongous, ribbit, ribbit. Great, frogosaurus, that's a thing now. A huge one jumps out of the water and lands like a ninja on a lily. It looks like a huge rock, covered with dark gray bumpy skin. There's no Prince Charming hiding in that thing, (laughs) no way. Whew! You hide behind a giant bush. That frog has an epic-sized tongue. Nasty. Not even that crazy tongue could save it from what was coming up behind it. The floating head of a giant crocodilosaurus wrapped erect something. It looks the same as a regular crocodile, only much bigger. Like it needed any help to make it scarier. Frogosaurus jumps back into the water and starts to swim away with its huge back legs. The chase is on! And pretty soon, they both disappear under the surface. Sure hope that guy made it. You almost feel sorry for the poor frog, but there's no time to think. The ground starts to shake. That's never good. A couple of trees near you crash to the ground. It looks like an upside-down boat. What is that thing? Oh, Turtlesaurus. That guy needs to lay off the coffee and protein bars. Um? What's that buzzing? It's getting louder and louder. Two things. One, that sounds like a bee. Two, please let it just be normal size. But instead of a tiny flying insect, a human-sized bee rex lands on the giant turtle shell. It's got its legs like a power lifter, and its antennas look sharp. If it's only one, that's okay. Hopefully. Out of nowhere, you hear a horrifying shriek. Oh, please make it stop already. A giant shadow covers the ground, and you look up some sort of bird-like dinosaur. These things actually have an official name, but you have no idea what it is. You only see its reddish-blue feathers, a sharp beak full of sharper teeth, and what are those things coming out of its wings? The bird sees the B-Rex and swoops down to grab itself a midday snack. But B-Rex hides under the turtle shell. (laughs) Good thinking. Something tells me I wouldn't be that fast or clever if that happened to me. I'd probably just… and then it happens. Its dark, creepy eyes notice you from a distance. You take a small step back. So far, none of the other animals have noticed you. Crack! A twig snaps under your shoe, and suddenly dozens of eyes latch onto you. Curious, angry, hungry eyes. Back to option number one, run! You're going as fast as you can, but everything seems hopeless. You've come to a huge cliff with a river way down at the bottom. You close your eyes and jump. Boom! Your whole body shakes. You open your eyes. You're awake. It was all just a bad dream, right? Right? And here you are, on Earth, 66 million years ago. It's one of the warmest periods in the planet's history. There are no ice caps yet. Everything is lush and green. Dinosaurs roam the Earth. Massive sauropods peacefully chew on flowering plants and trees, their young ones following closely by their side. Ah, You strain your neck to see their heads five stories above you. But that's when you see something else. A bright spot in the sky. A shooting star. Ah, make a wish. Wait a minute, the star grows bigger, brighter. Little do the mass reptiles know, today marks the beginning of one of the largest mass extinction events in Earth's history. Three-quarters of life on our planet will be wiped out. 
A, we'll just hide over here and watch. 5 seconds before impact. The meteorite rips a hole through our atmosphere like a needle in a balloon. The resulting supersonic shock wave starts to ripple around the globe. You'd hear it on the opposite side of the planet. The cosmic monster falling toward the Earth is the size of Mount Everest, at least 6 miles wide and weighing 460 trillion tons. The meteor is coming in hot and fast, 12 miles per second, heading right for the Yucatan Peninsula in present-day Mexico. At that speed, it could travel from LA to New York in under 4 minutes. Impact The mountain-sized asteroid smashes into the Earth. If only it had been anywhere else, life on this planet might look a lot different today. The Yucatan Peninsula, almost entirely underwater then, was one of just eight places on the entire globe that would have let a giant space rock wipe out nearly all life on the planet, meaning the asteroid only had a 13% chance of causing a mass extinction. And it happened to hit just the right spot. Well, aren't we lucky? At the point of impact, there's an explosion a billion times more powerful than even the most massive volcanic eruption. It looks like a new sun has appeared on our planet's surface. The meteorite digs into the Earth's crust and explodes into a million pieces. You can still see the scar it left. The Chicxulub crater is 93 miles wide and 12 miles deep. It could fit the entire state of Vermont and 24 Burj Khalifas stacked on top of each other. Something that leaves a scar like that has global consequences. The Earth ripples. The shock wave spreads for thousands of miles. The air blasts flatten forests in a second. Everything within striking radius is set ablaze. Nothing survives ground zero. But that was just the beginning. Smaller fragments of the meteorite, as well as parts of the Earth displaced by the giant hole it dug, go ricocheting out, reaching as far as Canada. The sky lights up with fireballs. They smash into the surface as well. Dinosaurs that weren't in the blast radius run in panic. But they have nowhere to hide. It's only about to get worse. The shock waves race across the sea. The tsunami is nearly a mile high when it hits the coast. The waves keep traveling, reaching the furthest corners of the planet. Even across the Pacific and up into the North Atlantic, they're five stories high. They wash away everything in their path. Besides the raging fires and skyscraper-sized tsunamis, the Earth is shaking from the worst earthquakes in history. A planet lush and teeming with life only a few minutes ago has turned into a nightmarish place. But this was only phase one. Five minutes after impact. Small rocks, dust, and ash rise high up into the atmosphere. These objects heat up and melt. They turn into hot lava that begins to fall to the ground like burning rain. 10 hours after impact. Fires continue to engulf everything in their path. Some surviving dinosaurs in North America try to escape to unknown territories. But now they're in dense swamps and can't escape. One month after impact. 15 trillion tons. Two and a half million times the weight of the Great Pyramid of Giza. That much ash and soot are released into the atmosphere. The cloud covers the entire planet and blocks out the sun. The Earth sinks into darkness. Surviving plants can't photosynthesize. Oxygen levels drop. Any animals left at this point are finally done in from lack of air. But the worst consequence was the extinction of photoplankton. The entire oceanic food chain starts to collapse like a house of cards. Many marine animals have lost their main source of food. Surviving animals on land also can't find anything to eat. There are no plants for the herbivores, and soon no herbivores left for the meat-eaters. And still, there's the acid rain. The Chicxulub meteorite hit a place where there was a lot of sulfur. The heat of the impact vaporizes the toxic gas instantly. It mixes with the air in the atmosphere. Acid rains fall all over the planet. The oceans become toxic. And if all that doesn't get them, the cold finally finishes off the job. With the sun blocked out, the burning fireball that is our planet starts to cool down. What's left in the wake? Plants are a little luckier than animals. Seeds and pollen are able to survive these harsh times. 
The first to slowly paint the charcoal planet green are ferns. The wind carries their seeds, sprinkling them across the Earth over 10 years. Then come the palms. The new planets produce oxygen and feed small mammals. Of the reptiles, only turtles and ancient ancestors of crocodiles can survive the temperature and acidity of the planet's waters. Unbelievably, some bird-like dinosaurs survive too. Other species of birds evolve and survive to this day. Sadly though, all terrestrial animals over 50 pounds in weight went extinct. It took much longer for the animal kingdom to recover. Larger mammals, such as rhinos, began to appear only 15 million years after the dinosaurs disappeared. Blue whales, the largest living creature this planet has ever seen, bigger than any of the dinos, only showed up a little over 4 million years ago. Did the dinos have a fighting chance? Scientists say that if the meteorite had hit in the deeper ocean, the story would have gone a lot differently. Yes, the resulting tidal waves would have been 10 times higher than the already massive ones that rippled across the planet. But even a giant mega-tsunami wouldn't be able to wipe out 75% of plant and animal life on Earth. What really did the dinosaurs in was the global blackout. If the meteorite had hit in deeper water, not the shallow sea of the Gulf of Mexico, there wouldn't have been so much dust and ash in the atmosphere. That dropped the oxygen levels and cut off the food chain from the very bottom. There's a theory that climate change and other conditions on Earth 66 million years ago would have still wiped out the dinosaurs, no meteorite necessary. It could be a supervolcano erupting and spewing out large amounts of sulfur and ash into the atmosphere. Perhaps the meteorite just sped up the inevitable. Now let's move on to a more interesting question. Could humanity survive a meteorite impact like that? Back then? Not a chance, obviously. But if something like that were to happen in our time, we have an advanced intellect and technology. We fill the cosmos with probes and satellites, so we know about any possible meteors headed straight our way. It wouldn't take us by surprise. Now, we might have to hide deep underground to avoid the blast wave and tsunamis. And you'd need enough food down there to last for at least a year. And don't forget your toilet paper. But with the right prep, humanity could stand a chance. The main problem after such an event is to survive the global winter when the ash covers the sky. But our species can handle it. Just ask anyone living in Omayakon, Russia. The town of 500 people holds a Guinness World Record for the coldest inhabited place on Earth. They've seen the thermometer read minus 90 degrees Fahrenheit. What about preserving plant and animal life? Our species has been working on that for a long time. There's a World Seed Storage Facility on Salvard Island. It's about 40 stories underground and can hold over 2 billion samples. The location was chosen because of the permafrost climate and low tectonic activity. Preserving all the planet's animals would be a tougher job. Perhaps genetic engineering, cloning, or something else would work. Herding them all down into a bunker? I mean, crocs, bears, and snakes included? Mm, I think I'd rather try my luck above ground, thank you. <laughs>